All right. Well, this morning, God wants to share with us about the fruit of the Spirit. And I titled this message, Evident. Because as I was studying this, I looked at that first word called fruit. Fruit. And what fruit is, it's the evidence or the result of something. Um, we're going to be digging into what the fruits of the Spirit are. Before we get started, let's just pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you will just help us to display the fruits of the Spirit so that we can represent you well. Amen. All right, so, like I said, we're going to be talking about fruit of the Spirit, and that fruit means evident. So evidence, the definition of evidence is something that provides proof to be seen the available body of facts or information indicating whether a belief or proposition is true or valid, and it's an outward sign. But even on top of that, it's another part of the definition is one who bears witness. One who bears witness. And we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. So if you want, you can open your Bibles to uh, the book of Galatians. We're going to be in kind of all over Galatians. We're going to be jumping around a lot, but mostly in Galatians. And you'll find the, the passage of the fruit of the Spirit is Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Against such things there is no law. So, with the, with the definition, part of the definition being one who bears witness, I wanted to go back to who wrote Galatians. Who is the one bearing witness here? Who's the one that wrote this out? So if you go to Galatians 1, verses 1 through 5, it starts out, it says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia. So that's what he's writing here. He says, grace and peace to you from God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul's the one writing this out, but he's doing it on behalf of the Father and on behalf of Jesus for us. He's clearly laying this out. If you guys remember back, some of you will remember back in October 2020, um, I taught a message uh, on from Saul to Paul. And I did that um, because he writes most of the New Testament. And sometimes we can, we can start looking at something that somebody writes and we're like, well, that's just a man. So, right? That's just some guy that wrote this down. So I wanted to dig back in, give a little bit of history on Paul, just so that we can know that where he's coming from is sound. If you look in Acts 5, he says, I didn't write the rest of the passage. Uh, he says, who are you, Lord? So, what, what we're going to right now is as, as Saul, who later becomes Paul, is on the road to Damascus, and he gets knocked down and he's blinded, right? And, and Jesus is talking to him, and, and Saul says, 
Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And Jesus says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So Jesus is telling him that he's going to tell Saul what he must do. I'm going to skip through a a few different verses, like I'm just going to get to the point. This is Acts uh, 5, verse 9. It says, For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Think about that. I mean, something drastic just happened, or dramatic, just happened to this guy, right? And so he didn't eat or drink anything, but he's sitting there, and he's thinking about it. He's going over in his mind what happened. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. Then the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. So we know what Saul's doing right now. He's not eating or drinking anything, but he is praying. And God hears him, and God reaches out to Ananias to go meet Saul. Acts 9. Thanks, babe. See? For one, helper, great. And then verse 15, it says, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go to this man. Um, go. Because Ananias wasn't real happy that, that God was telling him to go to Saul. And because Saul was out murdering Christians and stuff. So naturally, he's, he's a little set back by it. But the Lord, the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and the kings and to the people of Israel. Who's sending him? God is. Okay? Placing his hands on Saul. So Ananias obeyed. That was a good call. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. That's pretty outstanding. So then, he gets up, he's baptized, and then a couple verses later in 22, it says, Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. So we got this dude that God calls out. God fills him with the Holy Spirit, tells him, I'm going to use you as my instrument to go out and tell people about me. But he sends him out to the Jews and the Gentiles. He sends him out to everybody. But it says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then later it says, and Saul grew more and more powerful. He grew more and more powerful. So how did he grow more powerful? What was it that that made him grow more powerful? When he was a kid, he grew up and he was studying under the most uh, outstanding teachers of the time to teach the Jewish principles, the Jewish laws, the Jewish culture. And he was phenomenal at it. He was great at it. But this says, after he was baptized and he got filled with the Holy Spirit, He grew more and more powerful. He was able to go into the synagogues and wherever he went and convince people through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is the Messiah that they're looking for. It's awesome. Acts 1 verse 8 says, Jesus said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Jesus said that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. As we we start to decide that we want this relationship with God, that we want this relationship with Christ, and we make that decision, He starts to fill us with His Spirit once we accept Him. Excuse me. 
But then, I want you guys to understand something. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit's not weird. He's not weird. You know, people have all these different preconceived ideas of who and what the Holy Spirit is. They hear all these stories and all that stuff. I tell you, when power comes on you, and God is moving in you and through you and to you, you might not be able to contain yourself. And I hope that you don't. Because whenever you feel that power come on you, you realize that there's something much more powerful than you that can change things. But He's not weird. In fact, He's probably my absolute favorite subject to teach on, to preach on, to talk about. Anytime I get a chance, I absolutely love it. We were just talking about Him the other night. The second Wednesday of every month, we have a prayer and healing um, time of teaching, and we just we come in, we learn more about it, we get to discuss everything about it. Billy brought this stinking awesome testimony this past week of God removing a cancer, literally removing a cancer from his eye with absolute proof. Absolute proof. He had specialists look at it, had, had pictures of it, had to put it up on top of each other and map the veins going to it to prove that it was his eyeball because they couldn't believe what they were seeing. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Word says that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. That happens whenever you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But then we have the gifts of the Spirit and we have the fruit of the Spirit. And people are like, oh, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. It's totally different. It's totally different, but it comes from the same God. There is so much power. And you will start to change you will start to develop and start looking more like God. It's incredible. So we were talking about the Holy Spirit Wednesday night, and um, <clears throat> Chad Getz was there. Isn't that his last name? Yeah, Chad Getz was there, and he's, he's an awesome dude. For those of you that don't know him, he started this uh, basically like a house of prayer and, and worship down here on the square. Super cool dude. But... He was talking about how he loves coming here because we don't hide the Holy Spirit. And he was saying, you know, there's, there's places that you can go where people say that they believe in the Holy Spirit, but then they take him like this weird friend or weird uncle or relative or something and hide him in the basement whenever people come around and they don't want him to come out because they're like, uh, what if he does something that makes us uncomfortable? Well, I hope he does something that makes you uncomfortable. I hope he does something that makes me uncomfortable because I love it when he does because it's awesome. It's so stinking cool. So he's talking about how, how you know, you, you go in and you, and you go to these different places and, and you can tell whenever they're kind of shy or they're, they're, they're kind of afraid of him, you know, and they're like, well, they, they wait and they look around to see, well, does this person believe in the gifts of the Spirit? Does this person speak in tongues or not? You know, and if he does... If they do, cool. Bring up the weird uncle, you know. But we, we can't be hiding. We can't be hiding. That's what's going to change people is the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's job is to conform us into the image of Christ, making us more like Him. That's what He does. He comes and lives inside of us, dwells inside of us, because Jesus calls Him our helper. Our helper. He's our ever-present help in time of need. Oswald Chambers made a really cool statement. He said, The Holy Spirit works... I'm sorry. The Holy Spirit's work of grace is not complete in your soul until that soul has a personal Pentecost. His work in you is not complete until your soul has had a personal Pentecost. Y'all know what the Pentecost is. It's whenever Jesus said, go and wait. Go and wait until you receive power from on high. What He's saying is, it's better for you that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come because He's your power. Jesus couldn't walk around hand in hand with every one of us all day, every day, but the Holy Spirit can. 
That's why he said it's better for us. So what are the differences between the gifts and the fruit? So I already gave you the definition of, of fruit, of evidence. Fruit is evidence. I gave you that definition. A gift is a thing given willingly to someone without payment, or it's a present. Don't you love receiving presents? I love receiving presents, but I really love giving presents, especially to my kids. Look at that. Throat getting all scratchy and weird. <clears throat> I love giving a gift. I love giving gifts to my kids. And we are his kids. We're called sons and daughters. Jesus even says that we're no longer servants bound, but we are now friends with Him. And God gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. But along with that one gift comes many different gifts. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 4-11, through 11, it says there are different kinds of gifts, but... The same Spirit distributes them. Different kinds, same Spirit distributes these gifts. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but all in them, in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So all of these gifts that I'm getting ready to go over, they're all given for our good. The one there is given through the Spirit, a message of wisdom. So we got wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge. So we've got knowledge. Knowledge and wisdom are definitely two different things. You can have a lot of knowledge, but not a whole lot of wisdom. But there's, there is a difference. But the Holy Spirit divvies that out. The one there is given through the Spirit, a message of wisdom, and to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another is faith, and another gifts of healing. To another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, and to another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues and languages and still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. Have you ever wanted a gift of the Spirit, but you didn't have it? Because maybe somebody else had it, and you're like, look at whenever they operate in the Spirit, it's thinking, cool, man. I want to do that. I want that for myself. I want to operate in all of them. I do operate in some of them, not all of them. But these are gifts. They are freely given to you by the same Holy Spirit. And He determines who He's going to give what, when, where, why, how. Do you know that He can use anybody to accomplish His tasks and purposes? He can. If you don't believe me, ask Balaam. He used Balaam's donkey to speak to him. So the, so the donkey was speaking in tongues, apparently. He distributes this who, to whoever he chooses. But, Romans says, Romans 12, 6-8 says, We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. In accordance with your faith. Do you ever just like read something and then you just kind of read right over it? And you don't, let it, you don't let it soak in? You don't let it simmer? He's saying if you prophesy, prophesy in accordance with your faith. And I'm telling you, if your faith isn't strong, build it up. Build it up. Ask God to build it up in you because He will build it up in you. And then the more that you're around other people and you see God operate in the gifts around you, You see God operate and do amazing things. Your faith gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Whenever you're going through hard times, you persevere 
And that faith gets strong and strong. So the older you get, the more faith you should have. The older I get, the more faith I have. So prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. And if it's giving, then give generously. Isn't it crazy that God gives us a gift of giving? Of giving? That's cool. He gives us a gift to be able to give. And you know what? Everything that He gives us is for us to pour out. It's not for you to hoard. It's not for you to hold on to and keep for yourself. It's for the edification and the building up of other people's faith. That's what it's truly for. So, if it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. To encourage, then give encouragement. To give, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Show mercy is a gift? Well, yes, my. It is a gift. You know the word? I've always, I've always held on to this. It's to he who shows no mercy will no mercy be shown. And I tell you, I need more mercy than probably anybody I know. So I need to give it. I need to show it. And he says, do that cheerfully. Show mercy cheerfully. Galatians 5, 22-23 is again, it's the fruit of the Spirit. So, we just covered the gifts of the Spirit. Now we're going to cover the fruit of the Spirit. And this is really what I want to, what I want to impart with you guys today because it's so desperately important. If you, if you operate in the gifts of the Spirit, but you don't show the fruit of the Spirit in your life, people are going to question not only are people going to question it, but you may do more damage than you do good. If you bring the truth without love, the Word says that it's like a gang, uh, playing symbol. You know, it's, it's just annoying. Thinking annoying. So you have to bring it. The truth with love. And likewise, in love bring truth. So, so you have these gifts. They're, they're things that are, are to do outwardly, right? But now, the fruit of the Spirit is stuff that's inside. It changes you from the inside out. And it shows people, it's that representation that you are a Christian, that you love Christ with all of your heart. That He saved your life. Because you know what? Whenever it starts producing these things in your life, it produces them to a level and a degree that we can't possibly get to on our own. He's our helper. That's why He's able to do this stuff in us. In Galatians 5, 22-23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. The first one is love. I think that that's extremely important that the first one is love. Without love, what do you have? Nothing. You've got nothing. But God is love. God is love. And He produces this fruit in you and the very first one is love. The greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others as yourself. But He knows that we need help to do that. That's why He sent us the Holy Spirit. He's like, I want you to love people and I'm going to give you the ability to do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's going to be a fruit that's resonating in your life, that's, that's showing in your life, that's pouring out of your life. I'm telling you, we go back to like... A, High school reunions and stuff like that. And there are people that come up and, and start talking to me, and I guarantee you they see somebody totally different than they saw. Totally different. People that I used to work with on the police force, they see somebody totally different. People that I was in the Marine Corps, totally different. Totally different. I'm not that same person anymore. And the thing that's different is the Holy Spirit in me producing these these fruits out of my life. This is what changes. So Galatians 5, 13-14 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. 
You're called to freedom. But with that freedom, choose to serve other people in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. The entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. As I'm going through these, I want you guys to just sit out there and look at me and let these words bounce off of you. What I want you to do is think about each of these fruits. Think about your life and are you producing these fruits in your life? And if not, think about what you need to do to, to accept the Holy Spirit and His work and let Him work these fruits in your life more abundantly. Every single one of them. So the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit are given to whoever God chooses. The fruits of the Spirit, you get them all. You get them all. Now, He might work with you differently at different times in life, different seasons. He might be working on me with love here, but then He might be waiting to work with me on peace over here or joy over here. But I get them all. And He's going to develop them. Love. Man, love is so important. And it's the first one. The next one right after that is joy. Do you know anybody that doesn't display joy very often? You know, you're like, oh, I have to be around that person. That's not very common. Because they're not very joyful. I want the joy of the Lord to just bubble out of me. Nehemiah 8.10 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. His joy produces strength in you. His joy is what produces strength in you. That is cool, man. Peace. The next one's peace. This one's a big one, guys, because look at our look at our culture. Look at at um, just the everything that's going on. There's just so much that kind of steals our peace. Peace. So people struggle right now so much with a lack of peace in their life. We deal with anxiety. We deal with stress. We deal with all these things. You know, there's always the next thing we have to get to. There's always the next thing that has to be done. I don't have time for this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to do this. I've got to be there. I've got to be over there at the same time. I don't know how we're going to do this. God's saying, take my peace. Let my peace give you rest. Peace. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Peace guards our heart and our mind. It's like, great, I want more peace. If you want more peace, you need to let the Holy Spirit work in your life. That's what's going to give you peace. You can't develop peace on your own. You can't. You just can't. I don't care if you're on a, on a beautiful desert island somewhere, you know, with palm trees and, and waves. That's going to help. But I guarantee you, without the Holy Spirit and you've got all this other stuff going on, you're going to be thinking, man, I got to get off this. I got to get off this beach. I got this to do, you know, whatever. God is the one that develops that peace inside you. And then patience. Man, patience? Patience. Every parent knows you need patience. And every kid needs patience too to deal with us parents. Mine do. Don't shake your heads, girls. <laughs> Lots. I can guarantee you it's pretty difficult being my kid. So they probably do need patience a lot. It's reciprocal. It's reciprocal. But the Holy Spirit develops that in us. Ephesians 4 2 says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Be humble. 
Be gentle and be patient, bearing with one another in love. Isn't it great that he throws love back in there? That's going to help. But he's telling us things that we can do to help work on that patience. Now, kindness, Romans 2.4 says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind? So this is kindness. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? God's kindness. It's His kindness that leads us to repentance. That's what He means here whenever He says to turn from your sin. But it's His kindness that does it? His kindness. You think, well, how can His kindness do that, Nathan? How can somebody's kindness turn me from my sin to this guy? Well, just think about it. Remember whenever the lady was caught in adultery, she was caught right in the act of adultery. Being drugged to this dude, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders are taking her in the act. She's probably buck naked, being drugged through the streets up to Jesus because they want to see what he has to say about it. They want him to condemn her because the law says she must be stoned to death. He leans down and he's writing in the, on the ground. You know, who knows what he's writing, but he's writing nonetheless. If, you're, if, she's, if they're dragging her up here and she was just caught, then she's probably naked. And he was probably, in my opinion, being honorable and not looking at her. You know, because that's disgraceful. So he looks down and he's writing in the sand, right? They're, they're berating him with questions, wanting him to tell them, stone her. Stone her right now. Yes, she deserves it. Do it. Don't know where the dude was. He deserves stone too. But, Jesus in his abundance of kindness, the same spirit that was in him, whenever he was baptized, it says the, the Holy Spirit came down and rested on him, and remained on him. So he's operating in this spirit, and it's the same spirit that you and I have access to. The very same one. And he looks at them, and he says, whoever of you doesn't have sin in your life, whoever hasn't sinned, go ahead, stone her. Get it done. If you've never sinned. And from the oldest to the youngest, the oldest, because they've had obviously the most amount of sin in their life, the longest amount of time to sin, and they were the wisest, started dropping those stones and walking away. But then what did Jesus say? Did he tell her, okay, now you need to learn all the law inside and out. You have to follow it to a T. You have to go get baptized. You have to do this. You have to act like this. You have to do this. You got all these things. I mean, naturally, that's what we would do. You know, we want to tell her, this is the right thing to do. This is how you have to do it to be right. This is what you have to do to be forgiven. You got to go make sacrifices. You got to go all these things. No, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus himself, who is God in flesh, said, where are those that, that condemn you? He says, they're not here. He says, I don't condemn you either. Go. And don't sin anymore. That was what he said. It's recorded. That's what he said. He said, go and sin no more. His kindness, I guarantee you, turned that woman straight around. Because she was on the verge of death. We're on the verge of death. We should all be dead. We should all be stoned for everything that we've done. But because of Jesus' blood and His kindness and the fact that He went to the cross and shed His blood for our sins, we don't have to get stoned to death. That's awesome. That's good news. Thank you, Jesus. But His, His Holy Spirit continues to develop the same kind of kindness in us that Jesus had to be able to respond out of knowledge and wisdom and understanding and love and mercy and allow her to change. That's what allowed her to change, His kindness. That's why it led to repentance. The next one is goodness. Mm. He develops goodness in us. 
You know, there was a time where there was not hardly any goodness in me. Not hardly any. But he develops goodness in us. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. He chose you. He chose me. We are a chosen people. You are a royal priest. A holy nation. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For He called you out of the darkness and into His glorious light. He called me out of darkness. He called you out of darkness. If you're in darkness now, He's calling you. He wants you to come out. He wants you to be able to feel the love and experience what it's like to have His Holy Spirit living in you and producing these things in you. We don't want to be evil. We want to be good. And the Holy Spirit is producing that in us. Faithfulness. Did you bring your your book, Brittany? Oh, good. Good. Faithfulness. So I'm going to... I'm going to take this mic to Brittany. Hopefully this doesn't... Can you just come get it? I don't want a bunch of feedback here. There's a good chance you could get it. While she's getting ready, Psalms 37.3 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Faithfulness also means steadfast. It means loyal. To be faithful. We can't be faithful on our own. You can't be. I've tried. You can't be faithful on your own. It means steadfast and loyal and thank God that He produces that in us. So Brittany and I were talking about this last night, even, and uh, she started reading something and it it was super good. So I'm going to have her go ahead and read it to you. Um, 2 Timothy 2.11 If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And so we were just talking about, you know, um, if the Holy Spirit's presence within us accomplishes the fruits of the Spirit, it's not of our own strength and our own doing, the Holy Spirit in us accomplishes faithfulness, but then God's Word says that he remains faithful. That's who he is. He can't deny himself. So that allows us to remain faithful because he's operating in us. And um, I just, we were just kind of talking about how we thought it was such a good verse because um, there's so many times where we can get our eyes on ourselves and in our own strength and we're falling short and it's not enough. And, you know, um, so. It reminds me of that verse in the Bible, and he's way better about knowing references than me, but where uh, I think it was the centurion says that I believe, but please help my unbelief. And so it just encouraged us, even with the fruits of the Spirit, to know that God is faithful, that he cannot not be faithful. He cannot deny himself. And this little devotion I have, it says, God is faithful. His actions are not determined by who we are, but are inherent to his character and who he is. Even if you are unfaithful, God remains faithful. When you struggle to pray, he prays on your behalf. If you have trouble seeing God, he is dwelling among us. If you are weak, he is strong. He faithfully keeps every one of his promises. And at the right time, he will faithfully fulfill his promises to you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, that's a good word. You know, that's a good word. The next thing that he produces in us is gentleness. Gentleness. Are you gentle? Are you gentle? Something in my line of work that we that we often refer to is it's better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Just because you're in that garden doesn't mean that you're doing war things. It's good to be gentle. It's okay to be gentle. Proverbs 15.4 says, A gentle word, or I'm sorry, gentle words are a tree of life. 
A deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Think about the difference from when you have a choice to make. You have a response to be able to... Re- uh, you have an opportunity to respond to everything that goes on in your life. You can respond in a gentle manner, and that'll be a tree of life, or you can respond in a harsh, hateful, mean, rude, arrogant manner, and that doesn't produce anything good, does it? That's the first thing that pops up, though. That's the first thing that you want, you know, your flesh wants to spit out of your mouth. But it doesn't produce anything good. It doesn't produce anything good. All it does is tear somebody else down, makes them have something against you, and rightfully so, you know? We have to let the Holy Spirit produce this gentleness in us. Think about it. Are you gentle? Are you acting like God? Are you acting like Jesus? I was talking to a good friend of mine. He was our pastor in Indiana yesterday. We talked for like an hour and a half. But um, he was just talking about this very same thing, the, the gentleness and, and your, your ability to be able to respond to people and show them Christ's love and show them that you are this totally different person because of what He's done in you. And as we were thinking about gentleness, it, it reminded both of us actually of, of the, uh, the series The Chosen about Jesus and the way that, that this thing, I don't, Typically, I don't like any shows about Jesus or, or whatever, the Bible, because they always it seems to me like they just get things out of proportion, you know, except for The Passion of the Christ. But I can't watch that very much because I just bawl like a little baby. But The Passion is basically doing the same stinking thing to me. Um, but it's for different reasons, you know. It's Jesus showing, they're, they're showing the compassionate love and heart of of what I think is probably the closest representation as you can get to Jesus. In in my mind, it's just like, wow, that's incredible, but it's because He's so gentle. Brittany sent me a a quote by a lady named Lisa Perkertis. Thanks for that. I have no idea if that's how you pronounce her last name. It's probably not. What's that? Yes. Yep. Everybody hear that? That's how. It says, Choosing a gentle reply doesn't mean you're weak. It actually means you possess a rare and godly strength. Wow, how true is that? Choosing a gentle reply. It's easy to just pop off at the mouth. It's easy to just be rude and mean. Man, that comes so natural but it means that you possess a rare and godly strength if you can choose a gentle reply. She is so true. And then finally, boy, this is a big one. Just as much as love being the first one, he saved this last one for, you know how they say you save the best for last? I'm saying love is the best, but this is a real close second. And it's self-control. Self-control. Wow. Thank you, God, that you give me the Holy Spirit to help me with my self-control. 2 Peter 1, 5-9. In view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous uh, provision of moral excellence, and moral excellence with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, loving people just like they're your own family, and with brotherly affection with love for everyone, That is not an easy task. I don't know if anybody in here has tried it, but it's not easy. But it is possible. It is possible. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be 
in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling us we're going to be more useful, more productive. If we choose to grow like this, we're going to be more useful and, and productive in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, listen to this clearly, but those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. Did you catch that? So, so they were cleansed of their old sins. They were cleansed. But if you don't continue to go after Jesus with everything that you are, you don't continue to let the Holy Spirit develop all of these fruits of the Spirit within you, it says that you're short-sighted. You're blind, forgetting that you've been cleansed from your old sins. You've been cleansed from your old sins. Through Jesus, don't forget that. It reminds me of when Peter, James, and John got picked to go up on the mountain of transfiguration, right? Jesus takes these three up there. And they get to see something that no one had ever seen before. They get to see Moses and Elijah standing there talking with Jesus. In, right there in front of their face. Peter's like, oh, I should build shelters for you guys. Um, and then they get to hear the Father speak. And to the best of my knowledge, this last, this statement made by God Himself, the voice of the Father speaking from heaven, they hear very clearly. He says almost the same thing that He said whenever Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist. At that point, the heavens rip open. The Holy Spirit descends and rests on Jesus. And God the Father says, This is My beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This time He says something very, very similar. Super similar. He says, this is my son. The last thing that he says is listen to him. The father said, this is my son. Listen to him. That means this is the most important thing that you can possibly do. No, you don't need to build a shelter unless he tells you to build a shelter. Listen to him. Instantly. Moses and Elijah are gone. Jesus is still boom, all bright, white, shiny. And they're sitting there with their jaws on the ground. I want you to think about something. If you have a kid, if you have a child, and somebody decides to come to your house, And they don't pay any attention to your kid. They disrespect your kid. They act like your kid doesn't have your last name. How are you going to treat that person? I guarantee you, they're going to be kicked out of my house. And when I say kicked, I mean kicked. You better respect the Son. You better respect the Holy Spirit. The only thing that the Bible says is an unforgivable sin is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Because if you walk into my house and you disrespect my wife, bad things are going to happen. A righteous anger is going to build up and you're going to wish like crazy that you didn't do that. And that's what he's saying. The Father speaks from heaven and says, this is my son. Listen to him. Don't do your own thing. Don't think you can make up new rules. Listen to my son. Pay attention to my Holy Spirit. Jesus, as he's getting ready to leave and he's um, going away, he says, you've been baptized. But in a few days, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're going to receive something that's going to help you to be able to accomplish anything. In fact, greater things than I accomplished. Guys, the, the gifts of the Spirit are great. The fruit of the Spirit, in my mind, is better. 
because it develops you into a human being that looks like that looks like the Father. And if you develop those things, you let the Holy Spirit work inside you, build this stuff up inside you, make all these things to where you're looking like Him, you can rest assured you're going to be operating in the gifts. The gifts are going to come. You don't even have to try to seek after them and try to make it happen. It's a free gift. You can't earn it anyway. You can't. But there's one way to get it a whole lot faster. That's to ask the Holy Spirit to be in you and to build up these these fruits of the Spirit within you. And people might ask, how do you receive the Holy Spirit, Nathan? How How do you receive it? By accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then you will receive the Holy Spirit. You will. You absolutely will. Mark 1, 7. I'm sorry, 1.8 says, I baptize you with water, but He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. Once you accept and once you believe. Whoever believes in Me will not perish, but have everlasting life. You just accept Him and believe. Brittany and I were talking last night a little bit, and she's like, you're not really going to like go into all this, are you? And I'm like, no. But now I'm like, yeah. A little bit. Just a little bit. We were talking about when people start to obviously show the signs of the Spirit, the signs of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I've seen people that um, that literally as they get baptized and they come up, boom, like some people were just speaking in tongues. Like the Spirit just hit them hard. And it was obvious they weren't playing. They weren't kidding. But other people were going down in the same water, coming up in the same place. Literally, the same person baptizing them. They come up, nope. I don't know. I don't know. I can't explain that. We're like, well, do you get filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you get baptized with the Holy Spirit? Do you start displaying these fruits of the Spirit? Like after you get water baptized? And then we start reading through Acts. You know, and Cornelius, he's a Gentile, and all of his family's there, and people that he works with are there. And Peter's there talking to him. He's just talking. He's just telling him what God's done in his life, what he's seen God do with his own eyeballs. And before anything, while he's talking, they get filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they're they're speaking in tongues. And Peter's like, what is happening here? I've never seen anything like this. He hadn't. He was in the upper room during Pentecost. He saw all of them get baptized in the Holy Spirit, start speaking in tongues and being able to have knowledge and wisdom and all this stuff. But he'd been baptized. And he was a Jew. He's like, "This it's normal for me. It's not normal for these people. So then he goes on and he says, I'll just read you a couple quick verses. It's Acts 10, 44 through 48. Cornelius, it's, it's talking about Cornelius and his family. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Peter's looking around stunned. That's not what it says, but I'm sure he was stunned. He's looking around. He says, can anyone object to their being baptized? He's asking that because according to the Jewish law, they, they weren't supposed to be getting baptized in this way unless they were converting to Judaism. That's a whole other story. But they're being baptized. Now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterwards, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several more days. He wasn't wasn't water baptized. His family wasn't water baptized, but they're sitting there. And when the Spirit wants to fall, the Spirit's going to fall. And He's going to do what He's going to do. I've watched people get wiped out, man, just wow. You know, crying, ugly cry, snot and everything. They They didn't know it was coming. It was awesome, though. It was funny. I love watching that stuff. 
Acts 2, 36 through 39. This is where it can be a little bit confusing. It says, uh, be baptized in Jesus' name for forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So people are like, well, see, you have to be baptized in order to receive the Holy Spirit. That's absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. It is a great thing to do, and you should be baptized. The Word tells us to be baptized. I've been baptized. All my kids have been baptized. And it does definitely help because it's a, a thing of obedience. But the Holy Spirit, whenever it gets a hold of you, boy, that you start changing big time. So, if anybody here wants to just ask the Holy Spirit to come in you, ask the Holy Spirit to be your helper. Ask Jesus in your heart. Confess with your mouth and believe that He is God. And you will be saved. And then expect the Holy Spirit to move in you and use you in a mighty way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you sent your Son, Jesus, for us to be able to have this personal relationship with you. He suffered and died. And no greater love does anybody have than that. So that we can have a personal relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us on our own. You never leave us and you never forsake us because your Holy Spirit comes and makes its home in us, dwells in us, and helps us. Thank you for that, God. Thank you, Lord. God, I thank you that you hear our prayers. And if there's anybody here today that is desiring a relationship with you, God, hear their prayer and be with them, Lord. Change them forever. Continue to work in us, God. Continue to work in all of us so that we can accomplish your tasks and purposes. That we can represent you well. God, we love you and I pray that this, that this word will not return void, but it, it will go out and accomplish what you have sent it forth to accomplish, God. Thank you for the gifts of the Spirit and, Lord, for the fruits of the Spirit, that evidence that you are in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.